We welcome everyone joining us here on our Sacramento State Hornet football podcast, The Stingers Up podcast. Thank you for being here. I'm Jason Ross. Hopefully you get a chance to check us out every week and tell a friend. Let them know we are out there uh, covering your Sacramento State Hornets. Well, speaking of the Hornets, it was another productive week as the Hornets got the win this last weekend over Cal Poly. At one point it was 14-9. But then the Hornets, the Hornets really got it going and a cruise to a victory, 41-9. to nine. So what we like to do at the start of everything is kind of give you a layout of where things are for Sacramento State as they get ready to take on Portland State on Saturday. That's going to turn out to be a really big game. But let's say where they are now after the win. The top of the conference, still Montana State and Sacramento State, both 6-0 and in big sky play. The Hornets are 7-2 and overall. And right behind Sacramento State at 5-1 and one is UC Davis. Everyone below that, Eastern Washington, Montana, and now Portland State with two losses in league. Portland State's an interesting team because they are 5-4 and four and not ranked. People may have forgotten about them, but they just came off a great win against Weber. If they were able to beat Sacramento State, a ranked opponent, and then their last game is against Eastern Washington, another ranked opponent, that would give them seven wins, but a great win resume to wrap up the year. And there would be, what, five consecutive victories with two of their losses playing up to Hawaii and Washington State. That certainly would be a team the committee would have to think about. The Hornets are in good position. They could be in great position, though, with a win and really set up a dramatic Causeway Classic uh, next Saturday. Uh, this week, games to watch. Here's what the Big Sky schedule looks like. Number nine, Montana, is at NAU. You've got Idaho at number three, Montana State. Weber is at Southern Utah. Eastern Washington, now ranked number seven or eight, depending on the poll, against number four or number six, UC Davis. And then, of course, you have Idaho State at Cal Poly, along with the game we are concerned most about, Sacramento State and Portland State. So we mentioned Portland State. They upset number 24, Weber, last week. It was their first ranked win since 2018. That was against Montana. With Sacramento State, they're still cruising, and we'll see if they can keep that going uh, this week. Uh, Coming up on the show, plenty of things to get to, including Dave Lewis, who uh, does the games on TV, covers the Hornets there, and you get to watch Dave each week with Darren Arbett on the home games. He's going to join us in a few moments. Uh, We also are going to have an opportunity to talk to a crew that was part of history on Saturday night, the kicking unit. Long snapper, Dustin Cognetti, holder, Sam Clark, and the kicker, Kyle Sinkowski all had a big weekend. They've had a great season, and we're going to catch up with all three, kind of talk about the mechanics of of how it all has to go. We always see the end result of a made field goal, but a lot of work goes in between uh, the uh, end result. So we're going to catch up with those guys in a few moments. But before we do that, we always like to look back at the last game, a game that, as we said, started out fine, then kind of hit a little bit of a lull, and then the Hornets just cruised and won 41-9. to So let's listen back to another win for Sacramento State. Now here's another give to Scadaboo. Tries to find a running lane. He does. He scampers through, stays on his feet, and he gets into the end zone. Cameron Scadaboo between the hash marks. High steps his way in. Touchdown, Hornets. That was impressive. 23-yard touchdown run. A great drive of mixed, a mixed bag of run and pass. And the Hornets just pound it down the field and take the lead 6-0. With the, some of the crowd still arriving... The Hornets go down in less than four minutes and score their first touchdown. So first and 10 back at the 39-yard line. Brash looking to his right again. A quick throw. It's picked off by the Hornets. Scooting down the sideline goes Sacramento State. It's Munchie. Filer. It's a house call. Touchdown. Pick six. Filer with his third pick of the year and his first touchdown for number one. On first and goal, Asher O'Hara will keep it. He'll run left. He'll get towards the goal line. He'll stretch the ball out. He's in. Touchdown, Sacramento State. Asher O'Hara running off the left side of the line, and he's got a nose for the end zone. He punches it in. Well, after the Mustangs had nine unanswered points, we said that drive for the Hornets was important to reestablish momentum to let the Cal Poly Mustangs know that the Hornets have won five games in a row and that they're ranked number 16 in the nation. That's what they did. Mr. Sullivan, I want you to describe the field goal. This is your play-by-play debut from the end zone. (laughs) Can you do it? I can do it, but I won't see the snap. So I don't see the snap. Okay, we'll call the snap. We'll call the snap in the spot. Okay, and then we'll, and then you take it from there. Okay. Well, this one would tie school history for 14 made field goals in a season. It would extend the lead. 
and it's going to be a 40-yard attempt near side hash mark. Clark is the holder. Senkowski has had a great year this year, 13 of 16. And the right-footed kicker is getting himself set up, and the line of scrimmage is set to go. Snap comes in. It's good. How perfect was that, Danny? That looked like it was right down the heart. You called that early. Foot, it was good. I, I, I called it and was walking. The walk-off kick. I know. Steve, he said it's good, and was it to it, the 10-yard line yet? No. <laughs> it didn't Dan, move. It didn't go Danny, left. It didn't go right. a man of few words, just what you want in your radio play-by-play -play guy. Yes. <laughs> Well, here comes Kyle Sinkowski now on for what would be a school record as far as most made field goals in a season. It's going to be a long one. Yes, it is. His season long right now. Our crack reporter is heading toward the <laughs> goal post there. This yeah. is a biggie. Yeah, it was a 49-yarder. This would be 51. 51. This for a school record for most made field goals in a season. Clark is the holder. This is from the near side hash mark. Kyle Sinkowski to try to make some history here. Snap place down, the kick on the way, has the distance, does it? It's good! It's good! Kyle Senkowski sets the school record from 51, a bomb. Just clears the crossbar. Golf it's coach good. David Sutherland was there to make the catch out of the beer garden. And Danny, that thing crept. If there was a basketball hoop on the back of the goalpost, it would have been a basket. It was, guys. I mean, it was just long enough. Another two yards, and he wouldn't have made that. But it was a great kick. It was going. It was going to be good. It was just wondering if it was just going to be long enough. But it was. Great job. I'll tell you, if artist Gilmore, or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar <laughs> were under the goalpost, they would have been able to reject it. Fifty-one yard field goal by Senkowski. Most field goals made in a season for a Hornet, and the lead extends to twenty-seven to nine. Eight not, minutes left in the third. Not only does he break the record, but he breaks the record with a dramatic yes. kick that crawls over the post. Approaching the final minute of the third quarter. Could be scataboo time here. He has one rushing touchdown. He's in the backfield with Jake Dunaway. And they will give to scataboo. Oh, my goodness. Cameron scataboo runs right up the middle, untouched. The blocks were great. A huge hole right through the middle of the defense. Touchdown, Hornets. Offensive line. Scadaboo's done some great things, but right there, that was all line. Just checking with Danny. Danny, you got something there? Guys, you got to give credit to the offensive line. I could have walked that in, the hole that was that big. I mean, usually there's contact. I mean, think about the amount of bodies that are down there on the field at that point of contact. Steve, he wasn't touched. Great blocking up front. Lead extends to 33-9. to And it's Scadaboo in the backfield with O'Hara, Pierre Williams. And Gandy go left. McBride and the tight end Martin on the right side. Play fake. Rolling to his right as Asher O'Hara throws to the end zone. Wide open. It's caught. Touchdown, Marshall Martin. Great design. Roll out. Touchdown pass. Hornets now lead 40-9. to He was so open. It was, a, it was like when you're at the one-yard line and the tight end releases from his block and is open. He was just, that was easy money. On first and 10 for Cal Poly, playing out this final part of the quarter. Oh, look out. It's going to be another sack, and it's a tag team impact there for Sacramento State. Multiple players in there, and I think the one that's going to get credit is Brandon Knott. Well, that's going to expire time. Hornets win 41-9. to That is six consecutive wins for Sacramento State. At one point, it was just 14-9, to but then they blitz Cal Poly the rest of the game and get a nice, comfortable win against their rival. Sacramento State 41, Cal Poly 9. The Hornets are back in a tie for first with Montana State as both teams now at 6-0 in league play. All right, as you heard in there, part of history, the 51-yard field goal. What a way to do it for Kyle Sinkowski. He has just been on absolute fire, sets the single-season record for most made field goals, and there's still more games to go. He's the team's leading scorer. But it's the whole group, and after a couple of early misses in the season, Kyle has been great. The whole group has been great, and so I had a chance to catch up with all parts of the field goal operation as far as the snap, the hold, and the kick. Here it is. Sam Clark, punter, holder. Kyle Sinkowski, plays kicker. Dustin Cognetti, long snapper. All right, so let's, let's start. We'll start here, Dustin. How does this all work? What do you? We're going to kind of go through the setup of a kick. 
So what are you looking at first, right before the snap? Like, what's, what's your mindset right before the play? Um, well, I try not to think too much when I'm out there. Um, but I think first thing we do is we try and have some good communication uh, between me and Sam. So he lines up his uh, eight yards away. And then for me, it's just it's the same thing every time. So I'm just trying to make it as easy for uh, as easiest for Sam, you know, so he can get a good hold and then we have a good operation. Your tar- what are you are you focusing on a target with him or just a locate? Like what is your what are you looking at when you're snapping? Yeah, so I'm focusing on uh, just his front hand, um, and I, I my goal is just to put my hands where his hands are and have a good snap there. Yeah. All right, so Sam, I'm gonna go to you next. What? Your rhythm, your mechanics of this. You're, you have two parts. You got to pay attention to Kyle. You got to pay attention to Dustin. What? How do you? How do you navigate this? Yeah, similar to how Dustin said, just um, communicating and make sure you get the right eight yards and make sure everyone uh, correct amount of people are on the field and everyone's set. And then Kyle just lets me know and he's ready to go. And I'll just tell Dustin to throw me the ball back and I catch it, put it on the spot, and that's about all I do. And, but isn't it how much of it is getting the ball in the exact place, spinning, laces, all that kind of stuff? How I mean, you got to do all that pretty quickly. Yeah, it's like we have to have a pretty quick operation time, but Dustin gives me really good snaps every time, so it's really just catch it and put it down. Mm-hmm. Nothing too strenuous. Anything for you, uh, what's worse, a higher snap, lower snap, or just anything that impact you anyway? Um, I like to think I've got pretty good hands, so I'll just get it to the spot wherever it goes. All right, now I got to ask Kyle. Does he have because uh, Sam really have good hands? Yeah, he has. He has pretty good hands. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now your mechanics of this. So their parts are all very important before you even get ready to go. What What are you? What are your focus points? Uh, my focus points are are a little bit different because I'm not I'm not trying to worry about like the distance or anything of the kick because I want to keep uh, every kick the exact same. So really, I just kind of jog out following Sam. Um, wherever he kind of puts his uh, his like left hand down, that's where I start taking my steps back. Um, and for me, it's just I have just like a couple checkpoints for me. Um, no, and like after I've gone through those, I'm like confident going going through my kick, knowing I'm going to make a kick. So uh, we played in Idaho. There's been dome. There's weather. Any of that impact just even your pre kick routine? Uh, no, no, not necessarily. Because I grew up. Uh, and like really northern Washington, so we we've had some pretty bad weather up there. So I've I've kind of already seen it all. So kicking in the dome, it's it's always nice because it's it's really relaxing. You're not worrying about any weather. But uh, I kind of figure out like the weather in pregame, just like what the wind's doing. So last weekend, uh, the 51 yarder, just enough. How much did you think that made it by? Uh, I, th- <laughs> I think it was only good by maybe like maybe a yard, two yards. Yeah. What do you feel comfortable? All elements being right, what's your what's your max distance? Um, I think I think I feel pretty comfortable from from fifty eight if if everything's going good, maybe fifty nine. Mm-hmm. All right, Dustin, back to you. It felt like you guys all were really keyed in on the record. I mean, it was a great moment for for all of you. Uh, Kyle gets the, a lot of the attention, but you guys are all part of it. You, were you guys well aware of the the record being broken? Um. We were aware because there was a little uh, picture that came on the big screen pregame and kind of um, teased us about it. Um, but we went in there knowing, and uh, in those high-pressure situations, sometimes it's almost easier just to get the job done. So mm-hmm. that's how it was for me. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, Sam and his great hands, he uh, had a pretty eventful throw a couple games ago. How, what kind of grief did you guys give him on that fire situation he had uh, a few weeks back? Um, I mean, the grief – should have went to me. Um, overall, I mean, it was there. The throw was, was there. It was. It, the look was there. We had the look. Yeah. Um, maybe a little floater would have been good, but that all started with me, and that was yeah my fault. Well, so Sam, how how do you evaluate uh, your throwing on that play? On that play, I mean, overall, I actually think I'm a pretty good thrower, but I I, I get I got one chance to display it, and I sort of shot myself in the foot, but um. I saw a guy bloke just behind Charlie, mm-hmm. and then uh, I didn't want to lob it up because I didn't want him to intercept it and then run it back on me. Because as much as I rate my hands and my throwing, I do not rate my tackling. So <laughs> I thought just dirtying it was the best thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't think uh, Coach Taylor's going to set up any pass plays for you on fake punts or anything like that? Yeah, I think I'm the furthest player from the quarterback <laughs> room on the team at this point. 
Uh, you did get a uh, – you have a tackle, though. Didn't you get a tackle earlier this year? I think it might have gone down as a late hit in the end against Montana. <laughs> but but I, I, I'll, I'll chalk it up as a tackle. I'm not sure what the stat sheet says, though. So if the game's on the line, it's between you three to have to save the game with a tackle. Who's getting it done? Wow, nobody's answering. <laughs> no, Nobody. uh, Hornets lose? What's going on here? Uh, probably Dustin. I think Dustin's probably the most uh, – I don't know, just the strong, maybe, I don't know, he's probably just most likely to throw his head in there, <laughs> reckless abandonment, so I'd say Dustin, on, I'd say probably Dustin. Okay. Dustin, you agree with that? Are you, you going to make that saving tackle? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I make that tackle. Um, I had two tackles today in uh, scout kickoff, so make him play some ways, <laughs> best way I can. Nice. <laughs> and how about for you, Kyle, as far as goals now, you've, you've set school record that you can add on, and obviously when you score, it helps the team. Um, any further goals for, for you individually? Um, no, I think just just doing my job every single rep, even if it's just like uh, like just a PAT or maybe a game winner or just a kick before half. Uh, just making sure it's always always perfect, so like the the team has the best chance to win. Mm-hmm. I'll ask all you guys this. Going to start with you, Dustin. Then on how much fun is this season? It, you know where you are now, where things can still go, and, and the fact that the special teams is a big part of what you guys are doing. How much fun are you guys having? Oh, yeah, a lot of fun. Um, this is my first season playing here as a Hornet, um, redshirting last year. So it's a, definitely a different experience, and, yeah, it's great. I love being it. Yeah. Kyle, how about you, for you, how, how has the season been? Uh, I think it, it's been really enjoyable just because of how much success we've had. But, I mean, we all, we all, all three of us knew, like, we were going to have this success with how much work we put in. So I think we're all just enjoying and reaping the rewards of all the off-season training that we've had. And Sam, lastly, for you being in the program before this year too, and punting and your great stats there too. How much fun have you had individually and as a team? Yeah, I just think uh, winning's winning's always pretty fun. Mm-hmm. So that's obviously a plus. And then just being able to be out there with these guys and be a part of uh, Carl Carl's record on the weekend and stuff is just super exciting. Just to just to be a part of it and just do my little one eleventh to contribute. Yeah. Well, those guys are fun, and I'm glad they're enjoying their season. They've been fun to watch, and they're a huge part of the success of the 2021 Sacramento State Hornet football team. Uh, Also this weekend, as we mentioned, the Hornets are going to be at home. They're going to be taking on Portland State, and the guy behind the the television there on the camera, the voice that you hear on those Saturdays when you're watching the games is Dave Lewis. He's been doing Hornet football here for a while. Dave's a great guy. I get an opportunity to see him at the home games and him and now Darren Arbet. It used to be him and Aaron Garcia, but they do great work and they're trying to get out all the important information about this Hornet team and the last couple of years, what a program this has become. So it was a pleasure uh, earlier in the week to catch up with Dave Lewis. Dave, how are you? Uh, fired up for the week. This is going to be a you know, huge one coming up on Saturday. So, um, you know, we thought maybe two, three weeks ago, eh, Portland State coming in for senior day. But, you know, now there's a lot on the line for both sides. So it should be very compelling TV and radio. Yes. Well, I'm going to start with for you on this. I mean, you've done this for a while now. How much fun? It's more fun, right? When they're winning, how much fun are you having with this team this year? Oh, uh, gosh, I wanted to ask you that. You know, for the fans <laughs> that had been around for 25, 26, 27 years like you, you know, you've seen – uh, you know, sometimes, you know, competitive football, a lot of bad football, but never great football. And, uh, you know, to see what they've done the last couple of years, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. And the people around the program are so awesome. I mean, they were, they were just as nice when they were, oh, and seven of the big sky. Uh, but obviously now it's, uh, you know, different vibe around the campus and super positive and uh, definitely headed in the right direction. Yeah. So what's your takeaway now that you've seen this team this far into this year and, of course, you saw Troy Taylor's first run at it and was so successful two years ago. What's your takeaway when you watch these guys? What do you think of when you watch the Hornets? Well, I asked him um, last week about it. Like, were there some teams that you had in the past that got better as the season progressed? Because 2019, they were really good the whole year. You know, it's like, wow, okay, they're they're rolling through this. But, you know, we had some hiccups. And, you know, Dixie State, they won, but they weren't great. And then, um, you know, Northern Iowa, that third quarter was a disaster and the six turnovers and, and they played competitive at Cal, and, you know, things kind of turn around with Idaho State. So um, it's a team that's getting better, and I love the the vibe around them. Uh, Munchie Filer, star defensive back, you know, said it's really all about family. Mm-hmm. I said, is there a brotherhood among the defensive backs? He goes, no. He said, because it's not about the you know, DBs and the defense and the offensive special teams. We're all one. 
we're all connected. We're all family. And so it's about family, love, and accountability, and it's definitely paying dividends in a big way. Yeah, and I feel like one pivotal point for this team that really could have you know, derailed that theme and family and all together was Elijah Dotson, a good player, a great player, and the kind of the uncertainty as he, what's going to happen with him, and then for him to stop playing for this team, I thought, Dave, that was kind of a, a potential swing point and no slam on him, but a, a credit to the coaches and the team. It seems like that brought him even closer, and they've played even better. You know, there's that whole uh, cliche sports, in particular football, and that's been the case because, uh, you know, they didn't miss a beat. Um, you know, Fulcher's been hurt the last couple of weeks, but, you know, he's destined to have an outstanding career. B.J. Perkinson's played well, and then Cameron Scadaboo has made the most of his opportunities. Um, if Coach Taylor really wanted to go for it last week, he could have had his third consecutive 100-yard game. Hmm. Um, so it really has been a, a you know next man up and everybody chipping in. And they still talk to Elijah Dyson. I did ask them, and they said, yeah, he's, you know, he's still our guy. He's still family. You know, we, we love him. We wish him the best with whatever he you know, wants to do. But, you know, we had a team to play for and goals to accomplish. Yeah, it is amazing because, I mean, coaches say that, the next man up, but just to get the results and the production that they've had out of whether it's Fulcher or Perkinson, Scadaboo, as you mentioned, and it, and in other positions too, that just goes to the credit, I would guess, of recruiting and coaching to me. And that's what I always feel, Dave, every week, that this team is always so well coached. Yes, no doubt about it. In fact, we you know speak to the visiting coaches during the week, and they always rave about, the organization of Coach Taylor, not just the creativity, because obviously we see you know things unfold that you're not expecting, whether it's a, a trick play or you know something out of that bag of tricks, but uh, you know that they're so disciplined and you know functional and organized on both sides of the ball. It's a you know really well oiled machine and definitely peaking at the right time. I know that we're all talking about Portland State, but I mean, how can you not at least peek ahead, you know, <laughs> to the following week? Because that Conway is said to be the biggest one of all time. Yeah, I think you, me, Steve, Darren, you know, all of fans, everybody's doing that. The amazing thing is that the players and coaches don't. And that's probably the right thing, but it's impossible for me not to look at it. Oh, gosh. You know, in fact, Darren mentioned that on the telecast. He goes, Dave, you know, it's all about, you know, today it's about Cal Poly and next week it's Portland State one at a time. And I said, hey, you know, the players and coaches, you know, have to you know do it and think that way we can look at it. And, um, you know, with the history of the league, I think 1988 was the last time that both UC Davis and Sac State were really good in the same year where that game meant something. So, um, you know, it's been a long time coming and should be magic. But I know there's a you know real good team on the horizon Saturday with Portland State, and the focus clearly is on that game for the group. Yeah, I know you had, as you prepped for your game this week, you had a chance to talk to Portland State's head coach, Bruce Barnum, and they've done – I mean, here they are. They have actually an outside chance to get in if things go well. I think people forgot about them, but as people say, the win resume, if they win out, it's a big if, but it started with a win streak and then uh, you know validated with a great win over Weber State. Certainly if they beat the Hornets and then they beat Eastern the last week, that's a tough team to ignore. But what's your perspective on oh, what Coach Barnum thinks his team is as they get ready for the Hornets? Well, he thought that Weber State win validated what he thinks internally about where they are, you know, if you beat Southern Utah, Cal Poly, and, you know, name your third team, yeah, we're, we're playing pretty well. But beating number 24 in Ogden and taking a team that had been great in terms of pass defense and shredding them for about 300 yards in the air uh, really, you know, shows where they are right now. So I know Sacramento State's really concerned coming in. You know, it's kind of a cliche, you know, anybody can beat you. But, you know, Portland State has a lot to play for. They'd have to run the table with three ranked teams in a row to get there, but they inside their building are looking at a potential playoff uh, bid, and you know they've got to take care of it on the field to make it happen. And for them, it continues Saturday in Sacramento. Yeah, I think uh, what the Hornets have gone through here lately, it's, it's been amazing. I can't believe they haven't trailed since the fourth quarter at Idaho State. They've been in control of all these games. But now here's – I mean, I think from here on out, whether it's Saturday, the causeway, how much more football is after that – I mean, everything is about as uh, difficult as it's going to be, but I think this is what hopefully all that work and kind of what you alluded to earlier, Dave, hopefully it looks to me like they've gotten better and they're getting better, and I think that's really encouraging for the coaching staff, the players, and certainly Hornet fans. Yeah, not just the star players, but you're seeing the depth, you know, step forward. You know, the wide receivers, you know, when you make your little board on, you know, the different guys that could catch the ball, Mm -hmm. you have to go six, seven deep on the wide receivers because they throw that many guys. 
And uh, you, you could have nine, ten receivers in a, on a given day, you know, catching the ball and stepping up. Uh, Parker Clayton, you know, had a rough beginning of the season, and they weren't, you know, targeting him at all. It's like, hey, what happened to that guy? He's starting last year. And then now he's emerged as one of the, you know, clutch guys that you look to on third down. You've got, you know, the gold standards like, you know, Pierre Williams out there and Marshall Martin, but the, the freshman kids have stepped up. Uh, Coach Taylor said those guys early in the year, you know, like Gibson and Miller, and Gandy, they all had uh, what he said performance anxiety hmm. that, uh, you know, the game was moving so fast for them. But, uh, you know, middle of conference play, they were able to settle in, just play their game, and they've been big time contributors. Yeah, for sure. I know you brought up that uh, the, the program really feels like this is family. That's how they treat one another. Uh, they lost one of their family members. You guys did an amazing piece on Greg Knapp. Um, they've dedicated the whole season to him. Certainly his life was taken too soon, but he was he was a Hornet. I, and he, I know he's been everywhere in the NFL. It's a really amazing career, but it was so great to see his family back, uh, kind of the love that was shared and, and reflecting on a, on a great person. I know you guys captured that on, on TV, but I just think that that's really a, a nice feel, I guess I would say, that the program is, is always going to treat him, and he always treated them like family. Unfortunately, I didn't get to meet him, but I've talked to so many people this season who – he was close to, uh, from coaches to fans. Uh, you know, Darren knew him very well, and uh, you know, I kind of get a sense of the man. So when I saw the you know the video tribute Saturday that we put together for TV, I teared up. You know, going into commercial, um, just because I, I kind of feeling like you know I didn't know him, but in a way I did. And I know his uh, widow Charlotte spoke with the team on Friday and let the bottle up her speech because uh, you know yeah. the second half they came out you know blazing and took care of business again. I mean, it's just a you know wonderful tribute that they've done to uh, honor Coach Knapp all year, and uh, his legacy will live on. Yeah, and you've, you've worked kind of that Hornet family too, whether it was Aaron Garcia, now uh, Darren Arbett, um, just seamless transition there for you. How's that been just on, a, on an individual level, just you know broadcasting with some, some Hornet legends? Oh, it's uh, an honor. You know, when I you know, look into the record book and I see – um, the things they've accomplished, you know, Aaron played forever in the arena league. So I actually did arena games where he was playing and when he was even coaching in Las Vegas at the end of his AFL run. So to be in the booth with someone like that, so accomplished is, uh, you know, amazing. And then Darren, I've known since the Sabercats, there's a mm-hmm. poster of him inside the Hornet locker room. Uh, so we worked arena together and, um, you know, we love talking football, you know, for us, it's just a, a fantastic ride. In fact, I even asked him, I said, Hey, what if we did the games for, Cal Poly. He goes, yeah, that'd be all right. But it's nothing like doing it here. Mm-hmm. It's nothing like doing it where he's home or his family, where he, he knows all the, love the former players and the coaches. And uh, for us, it's a chance to you know, really reconnect with the community. And, uh, and I love the area, I love what we're doing. And uh, I just hope this is not uh, the end of the season, but uh, the beginning of a great run. Yeah, it sure seems like it. I mean, that's the vibe that's going on and it's, it's fun, right? When, right. They're playing like this. So, uh, Dave, I look forward to seeing you on Saturday, and uh, hopefully the Hornets can keep this thing rolling. Jason, it's an honor to be on your show. I've been a, a big fan for a long time. I'm beyond a groupie, but uh, not a stalker, <laughs> so I'm kind of in that safe gray area. You know, there's no cops involved. I, I mean, I love what you do, and uh, keep up the great work. I, I always keep the cops close, so just, you, you, you know, you may not know that they're involved, but they're always involved. I'm always peeking over my shoulder. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. We look forward to seeing you Saturday. All right, man. Thanks a lot. It is going to be a big one on Saturday. Thank you to Dave Lewis. Thank you to Kyle Sinkowski. Thank you to Sam Clark. And thank you to Dustin Cognetti and all of you out there for listening. But those guys for all helping out in this week's podcast. It is the Hornets and Portland State in another big matchup. A salute to seniors. And then it's the Causeway next week so this season is is going quickly it's been a very productive season and we'll see how much more drama is left with this football team so thank you so much for listening we're back next week for another edition of the sacramento state hornet football stingers up podcast